Hello and happy Father's Day to all of the fathers and to all of the future fathers. I actually just got finished up recording uh, another video and I, I said let me go ahead and just uh, record this, this Father's Day message. Last week, which is, which is the Sunday before this Father's Day, I spoke at a, I did a short talk at a men's prayer breakfast and I was just impressed that while I'm recording, let me just go ahead and, and, and share this message and get it ready for Father's Day. This is going to be a, a challenge, a challenge to the men. We're living in a time where the idea of what a man is is changing and I, I entitled the talk, What is a Man? And so I want you to share this. I want you to share this with other men, uh, not, not just fathers, but other men that you know that you think will, will benefit from this. And uh, let's go ahead and jump right in uh, because I don't want to take, take up too much of your time. And so uh, let's bow our heads for a word of prayer as we look at this topic, What is a Man? What is a Man? Father God, thank you once again for manhood. Thank you for fatherhood. It's a blessing that you have given to men, and we need to understand exactly what that means, particularly at this hour in Earth's history. And so we're asking for guidance and wisdom. We ask all these things in the name of Jesus. Amen. What is a man? When I was growing up, these are some pictures of, of what people perceived as men. Uh, Rambo, Sylvester Stallone, he, he starred as Rambo, and you see him there. With the, uh, with, the, with the muscles popping out, holding a bazooka, and uh, Arnold Schwarzenegger, uh, he's there with, uh, with, his, with his sword. Uh, obviously, when I look at these pictures, you know, I feel like I'm looking in a mirror, you know, as, <laughs> as uh, I'm sure some of you uh, feel you do. But there's not many of us that look like that. There's not many of us that look like that. But uh, sometimes this is our, our idea of what a man is. And so that's the question I want to ask today. And this is from an article. It's from people who are under 25 years old. And it simply asks the question, what does it mean to be a man? And this is one of the responses that a 24-year-old 24, 24 named Will had to say. It says, being a modern man means being comfortable with a much broader idea of masculinity. The ideas about what makes a man feel a lot less restrictive than they were in the past. It's much more acceptable for men to openly express their emotions, talk about how we're feeling, be caring, and not fit into traditional ideas of what makes a man. There's still a long way to go, but this is really positive development in the right direction. Now this answer is a, it's, it's a decent answer. Um, we, we shouldn't be chauvinists or, or anything of that nature. That, that's not what makes a man. But there's, there's no doubt that what we see happening in society right now is that the idea of manhood is being discussed more and more. And what's happening is, is that things are going to swing too far in the other direction, or it may swing in the other direction. And we may find men trying to be on two extremes. There's a statement that is the most clear and succinct definition of what a true man is, a godly man is. And it was actually quoted on Forbes.com in their section, Forbes Quote. And this is a statement from Ellen White because it's a very good quote. And by the way, this, this, this is literally from Forbes magazine and they just compiled all of these uh, various quotes and this just happened to be one of those quotes. It says, the greatest want of the world is the want of men, men who will not be bought or sold, men who in their inmost souls are true and honest, men who do not fear to call sin by its right name, men whose conscience is as true to duty as the needle to the pole, men who will stand for the right though the heavens fall. As I said, this is one of the best definitions of a man that I have ever read because it talks about truth, it talks about integrity, it talks about not being afraid to speak the truth and call sin by its right name. This is being lost in today's world. And so as I'm talking about this in the context of the church, I want to ask a question right now. And that question is, why are there so few men in the church? This is something that is prevalent. And, and today I want to issue a challenge to all of the men that are watching this to step up and to get involved, not just in church, I, I, I want that too, but to really understand what it means to be a man at home and how to lead a household, if we're not leading the household in the way that we should. Now, all of us fall short. 
I'm not sitting here saying that I have it all together because I don't. I make mistakes all the time. Uh, there are areas that I need to uh, grow in. But at the very least, we need to be challenging ourselves as men to do better, uh, leading not just our families, uh, but making sure that we are right with God first and that we have a relationship with God and that we are moving our families and then eventually our churches in the right direction. So this is what this article had to put forth about why there are so few men in church. It says one theory is that the church's teachings emphasizing humility, holiness, and introspection are seen by some men as weak or somehow less than masculine. Men are looking to be challenged with a bold message of adventure, danger, and aggressiveness. So this is saying that some are not there because the Bible teaches about humility, uh, submission, meekness. And for many men, these are things that might seem uh, off-putting. These are things that might seem uh, to indicate weakness, but we're going to see that these things are not weakness. It goes on and it says that churches are having trouble finding the right activities to attract men with that also being a challenge for many churches. Some congregations make an extra effort to provide times of uh, fellowship and bonding for men by adding hunting expeditions, fishing trips, sports, etc. to their schedules. It goes on and it says, another theory is that many churches knowingly or unknowingly create a feminine atmosphere with their decor, floral arrangements, pastel colors, frilly curtains, and pictures of passive pastoral scenes make for a peaceful ambiance, but they tend to make men feel discontent. Some churches attempt to appeal to masculine sensibilities by changing their decor to something edgier, darker, more robust, and less nurturing. So when I look at these things, I, 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 I guess it's fine if people want to plan a fishing trip and you know, guys want to get together and play basketball and things of that nature. I'm not fighting against any of that, or I'm not one who likes pastel colors or, you know, frilly things. So all of that is fine and good, changing the decor of the church. But that's not really why a man should be attending church to get. A man should be attending church to give. A man should be uh, uh, so uh, appreciative of what Christ has done on our behalf, that we want to uh, share that with others, that we want to give, no matter how the church looks or whether or not there's a fishing trip or basketball being played or whatever the case may be. True manhood is ready to uh, stand and to be a part of something that was started 2,000 years ago when Christ commissioned uh, that group of men, his disciples, to go into all the world and to preach the gospel, to teach, and to heal. This is the call that God is looking for us to answer. Now, one of the things that is most important, and I want to highlight this, is another hypothesis states about upbringing. It says, most men were reared by fathers who did not attend church services and so have no role model for masculine involvement in a church. There is the suggestion that men, the traditional breadwinners, are too busy working or enjoying their day off to commit to a church, and overly sentimental church music is sometimes mentioned as something that keeps men away too. Now, I want you to keep that thought in mind because a lot of men are not in church because they did not have a, a good example and a proper example coming up. But all of these things are various reasons about why there are so few men in church. And so today I want to challenge all of us that if we are not active in our churches, or if we could be doing more in our churches, that we really prayerfully consider what it is that we can uh, do to, to take on this challenge of advancing the kingdom of God. And, and by doing that, we will find a purpose and we will find a, a proper idea of ourselves as a disciple of Christ, as a man of God, to be involved in this great mission of sharing the gospel and sharing the three angels' messages with the world as we're living at this particular moment in Earth's history. Now, I want to take a look at a few examples of what the Bible defines as a man or as a godly man. And the first one is in Job chapter 1, and it says, There was a man in the land of Uz whose name was Job, and that man was perfect and upright and one that feared God and eschewed evil. So Job was a man that was upright. He feared God. He was perfect. Job was a man. Let's go on. What did Job do? It says here that Job's sons went and feasted in their houses, every one his day. 
and sent and called for their three sisters to eat and to drink with them. And it was so, when the days of their feasting were gone about, that Job sent and sanctified them, and rose up early in the morning, and offered burnt offerings according to the number of them all. For Job said, It may be that my sons have sinned and cursed God in their hearts. Thus Job did continually. So Job was constantly, as a man, as a man of God, interceding for his family, interceding for his children. And he was also making sure that he was right with God. Let's go on. Genesis chapter 18, this is talking about Abraham. God wanted to make of Abraham a great nation so that all the nations of the earth would be blessed in him. And it says about Abraham, for I know that he will command his children and his household after him and that they shall keep the way of the Lord to do justice and judgment. And when this talks about commanding his household, it's not talking about doing it in a negative way, where you're just going around and sprouting orders and trying to force and coerce and, and compel people to do things your way. It's talking about commanding his home after him, meaning that it was based on how he was living his life and his family and his household would be able to see that, and then they would become attracted to the gospel. You see, one of the things, especially with children, or maybe I should say wives too, they're very good at seeing uh, the holes in our lives, the, the, the hypocrisies, right? And so, uh, you know, my son has, has called me out many times on, on, on things in my life that uh, were not, uh, you know, up to par. And so even as a man, I have found myself many times over the years, having to apologize to my son, if, if perhaps I have uh, been too harsh in punishment or whatever the case may be. All of these things are important for us, for our, our, our wives and our children, to be able to see that while we are striving uh, for the, the perfection in Christ, to, to submit to Christ, to achieve that, uh, that perfection that Job had, that we recognize our weaknesses and that we are humble enough and meek enough meek enough to have a repentant spirit, to apologize when apologies are needed. These are not things that indicate weakness, but rather these are things that indicate moral strength as we're talking about what is a man. And so men need to know the times that we live in. First Chronicles chapter 12, verse 32, it says, And the children of Issachar, which were men that had understanding of the times, to know what Israel ought to do. Do we understand the times that we're living in? Do we understand that we're living at the end of time and how we ought to be living our lives? These are all things that are important when we're talking about this concept, this idea of what is a man. This is another important verse about what it means to be a man. It's Numbers chapter 12, verse 3. It says, Now the man, Moses, was very meek above all the men which were upon the face of the earth. Now when we think about this, generally speaking, we're not going to look at the word meek as something that indicates manhood or strength. But I want us to understand that, that the, the ideas that are here on earth are different from the ideas in heaven. And it says that, Moses was meek above all the men of the earth. And Jesus talked about what? The meek shall what? Inherit the earth. So in heaven's eyes, humility and meekness is looked at as the ultimate strength. And I've told this to my son many times because one of the things that I try to uh, practice as much as possible, I do lose my patience uh, sometimes, but I try to practice patience with his mistakes. But one of the things I always say to him is don't mistake patience for weakness. So sometimes we believe that meekness means allowing people to run over us or whatever the case may be. But that's not what it's saying. Uh, because with that meekness also comes that statement that we read earlier that uh, the greatest want is the want of men. Men, men that will stand for the right, though the heavens fall. And so uh, Christ was the perfect blending of, of all of these things. And we're going to see that in just a moment as Christ is the representation of the ultimate, of the ultimate man. You know, one of the things I wanted to highlight as we're having this discussion about what is a man is the difficulties that we can face as men, the frustrations we can face as men, sometimes even the depression that we can face as men. 
and one of the greatest men of God that was translated to heaven was the prophet Elijah, who had reached the end of his rope. And it says here in 1 Kings chapter 19, And when he saw that, he arose and went for his life and came to Beersheba, which belongeth to Judah, and left his servant there. This is basically because his life was being threatened, threatened by Jezebel. She was trying to kill him, and so he ran for his life. And it says that he went a day's journey into the wilderness and came and sat down under a juniper tree, and he requested for himself that he might die and said, It is enough. Now, O Lord, take away my life, for am I not better than my father's? Elijah was frustrated with the difficulty of his life in his role as a prophet of God, and his life was being threatened, and he wanted to die. And God came to him. God came to him and saw him in his weakest moment and, and ministered to him and was able to uh, re restore him. And eventually, eventually, uh, he, he, he took him, this faithful man of God, to heaven. Now, the reason I'm saying this is because being a human being is challenging. Being a man in a sinful world is challenging. And we're going to have moments, we're going to have low points where uh, we feel, where we feel how Elijah felt. But in those moments, we can take comfort in knowing that God doesn't abandon us in those moments. Even sometimes where we may run away, you know, escape to the man cave or, you know, whatever, whatever it is. Um, sometimes as men, yeah, we, we, we do know, know that. Ladies, please understand that sometimes men, you know, we just need to get away a little bit and, and, and decompress, uh, recalibrate, and then come back. But this is what, this is what Elijah was, was, uh, was doing. This is what Elijah was doing. And so God was there with him, and God strengthened him and restored him. And I, I'm, I'm speaking to all the men directly. In these moments, God is there. He will be there, and he will, re he, he, he will restore us and strengthen us. But we need to, we need to, need to as well, always keep God at the center of our lives so that we give him permission, we give him permission to be there when we need him most. We need to understand this because as men, as human beings, there are times where we will come short. And it says here in Proverbs chapter 24, verse 16, for a just man falleth seven times. What kind of man? A just man. And what do we know about the Bible? What the Bible teaches about the just? It says the just shall live by faith. So faithful men, we see this in scripture, faithful men had experiences where they fell short of the mark. But that kind of man falls seven times and rises up again. And so no matter where you are in your life right now, I want you to understand that God is there and wants to be there for you and wants to, uh, wants to pick you up. And he doesn't want to pick us up so that we keep falling. The Bible tells us in the book of Jude that God is able to uh, keep us from falling. And so the goal is to learn how to have a life of continuous surrender to God. But if, if there is a falling short that takes place, allow God to pick you back up, clean you up, and have you continue on in the journey. These are all things that define what a man is when we're asking the question, what is a man? And so as we're coming to a close, I want to take a look at the attributes of the ultimate man, which is Jesus Christ. Jesus spoke the truth in love. Jesus wept. You know, I used to use that uh, Bible verse in, in my worships. Uh, my mother would always require us to say a Bible verse, and my, my, my sister and I didn't, you didn't know it as many at the time, so we would always want to say Jesus wept as, <laughs> as our Bible verse. But Jesus wept. Jesus cried. Jesus acknowledged uh, his, his emotions and his sadness, and there's nothing wrong with that. It also says that Jesus whipped people out of the temple. And I'm not telling anyone to <laughs> whip anyone out of the church. But what I'm showing you is these, these, the, the, the range, the range of, of emotions that a man may have and uh, righteous indignation. Not indignation related to self, but indignation related to the, uh, to the cause of God. When handled properly, when handled properly is something that Christ did and it's something that we should do as well. Jesus showed compassion. Jesus preached, Jesus taught, Jesus healed. And you know, as I read that, this, as I read this text about Jesus wept, one of the things that my, my wife and my son 
are uh, sort of always tease me about. They call me the robot. <laughs> they call me the robot because you know I'm I'm you know not not really an emotional person. I'm, I, I I tend to uh, deal in you know I guess logic more than my emotions. Um, and uh, you know so my son you know has only seen me cry one time. He didn't even believe that I could cry uh, because. Um, you know, that's just not something that he has seen a lot in me. But as men, as men, we need to recognize that that is a human emotion. And, you know, our, our emotions, uh, when appropriate, uh, can and should be expressed, uh, even in front of, our, uh, even in front of our, our children, so that they can understand that we're human beings as well, and we're going through the same experience as they are. It goes on and it says, Jesus healed. Jesus always put others first. Jesus forgave. Jesus suffered for others. Jesus was always patient. Jesus humbled himself. Jesus never fell. And why was Jesus able to do all of these things? Because Jesus was always dependent on the Father. And this is the most important thing. If you forget everything else that we talked about today, what we need to understand as men is what Jesus understood as a man, that of his own self, of his own self, he could do nothing. Everything that he did, he did depending on his father. And so this is what enabled him to be able to do all of the things on this list. And by God's grace, Christ is our example, and he, he is the one that can empower us, if we submit to him, to, do, to, to be men like this as well. And so as we close, as we close, I want to read that quote that we read in the beginning. It says, The greatest want of the world is the want of men, men who will not be bought or sold, men who in their inmost souls are true and honest, men who do not fear to call sin by its right name, men whose conscience is as true to duty as the needle to the pole, men who will stand for the right, though the heavens fall. And so today, I want to encourage you on this Father's Day, to all the fathers and to all the future fathers, I want to, to encourage you to ask yourself the question and to answer this question for yourself. What is a man? And not just what is a man, but more importantly, am I a man? Am I a man of God? I pray, I pray that we will align ourselves with Christ so that we can have access to the same power that he had and become a man as Christ was a man. Let's bow our heads for a word of prayer. Father God, thank you once again, Lord, for this time that we spent in your word and this little short message for Father's Day. I pray that you would be with us as men, that if we have households, that we will lead our households in the right way. That if we don't have a household, that uh, we will be taking the time now to prepare ourselves that if and when that comes, that we will be prepared to lead a home. And so, Lord, as we seek to be right ourselves and seek to make our homes right, I pray that the church can be built up and made up of homes that are being led by men of God. We ask these things in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. Happy Father's Day, everyone. God bless.